Nancy Niemeyer's garden. So Nancy Niemeyer is in Clayton. She has a large corner lot. It's a 3,000 square foot garden. This was her before photo taken about 2015. And this is the after. Uh, this garden is 99% native, clearly putting to bed the idea that natives are not colorful or beautiful. This garden was installed in the spring of 2016. And this garden is really special because Nancy is so artistic. She is passionate about both nature and archaeology. These interests intertwined in the development of the garden that she designed and installed, which was modeled on ancient Roman gardens. This rectangular courtyard, planted with a riot of colorful natives, leads past art pieces, a black on white geometric patterned mosaic, which was designed and created by Nancy, a fountain and pedestals that both frame the garden beds and function as seats. This beautiful sculpture is a centerpiece of her garden. And native bees, ladybugs, butterflies, quail and people are drawn to this garden and you can see why. So we'll go now to Nancy Welcome to the program, Nancy. Let me stop sharing so we can bring you on. Okay. Hello, Kathy. Good morning. How are you? Very good. Good. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. So um, I understand you'll be talking about practical tips for gardening with California native plants. And um, one thing that I wanted to ask you about was how did your water use change after you removed your lawn? Well, originally I was watering the lawn twice a week from about 25 to 35 minutes, depending on the season. So <clears throat> now I'm watering once every four weeks for about an hour or so. I would say it dropped about 75% in the areas that were lawn. Uh, I think overall my water use uh, for the entire property dropped 50%. So it, it was considerable. That is considerable, especially in Clayton and for such a large lot. Well, I think we'll go then, Jessica, right into Nancy's video. We'll be watching her video and then we'll be answering questions. So type your questions into Zoom. Hi, I'm Nancy, and this is my California native plant garden in Clayton. Most of it is now five years old, although there is a section that I added about two years ago. My garden is a bit unusual in that it's inspired by ancient Roman pleasure gardens. I created the design by reading about Roman life and looking at frescoes from Pompeii. To help support the Roman theme, there is a mosaic, statues, a fountain, columns, and other hardscape elements. I made the mosaic myself out of small black and white marble cubes. In this video, I'd like to talk about some of the practical things I've learned since I planted my first California native garden in the 1990s. Let's start out by talking about how to water established drought tolerant native plants. Watering natives is a somewhat controversial subject, so I'm just gonna talk about what I do. I'd like to emphasize that this is about established natives. You have to water new plants more often than established ones during their first year because their roots haven't fully developed yet. During the rainy season, native plants do best if they have a steady supply of water to grow, flower, establish deep roots, and prepare for the dry season. Even natives that bloom in midsummer and fall are able to do it because of the energy reserves they built during the rainy season. Since natural rains are often unreliable, I water my native garden every two weeks from November through mid-April unless we've had at least a half an inch of recent rain. I think that's why my plants grow so well. Watering during the dry season is very different. Since most native plants aren't actively growing then, they need little or no water to survive. However, I think giving my natives occasional water in the dry season helps them handle the heat and look better. Plenty of experts would disagree with me. They believe that since wild native plants don't get summer water, garden natives shouldn't either. 
What they may not realize, though, is that the native plants growing in our gardens are not necessarily the same genetically as their wild relatives. That's because many native plant cultivars came from plant breeding programs, not from the wild. Plant breeders make a profit by developing native plant varieties that are beautiful, vigorous, adaptable, and easy to care for by the average gardener. Since average gardeners water during the summer, most of the native cultivars sold in nurseries are able to tolerate it, at least occasionally. To understand just how much plant breeders can change wild natives, think about manzanitas. There are many different cultivars that are able to handle garden conditions that their wild relatives never could. As a result, manzanitas are so popular that even big box stores sell them. So, back to how I water my established plants in the dry season. Native plants often have a bad reputation because most people water them far too often and not nearly for long enough in summer. This keeps the soil surface continually warm and moist, leading to root diseases and causing the plants to develop a shallow root system. Shallow roots are bad because they dry out quickly, are more exposed to heat and cold, and don't hold the plant securely in place during high winds. So how long and how often should you water your natives during the dry season? There is no one-size-fits-all solution because it depends on the soil, climate, irrigation equipment, and plants. In my garden, with its clay soil and inland temperature extremes, I water for an hour once every four weeks. That may or may not work for your garden. So although I can't tell you how to water in your own garden, I can tell you how to figure it out. Dig a few test holes. This is how I did it. After watering a dry section of my garden for 30 minutes, I dug a hole the next day to see how deeply the water had penetrated. I waited until the next day so the water had time to soak in completely. When 30 minutes of watering turned out not to be enough, I watered a different dry section of my garden for 45 minutes and dug another test hole the next day. That wasn't enough either, so I watered for one hour and dug another hole. Success! Watering for one hour got moisture down to about four inches, which was where I wanted it. Just some words of advice about the testing. Don't assume that twice the time will always give you twice the water penetration. Also, if the soil is very different in another part of your garden, test it separately. How often you water will depend on the type of soil and climate you have. Most experts recommend that you should wait at least until the top three to four inches of soil have dried out before watering again. It's a good idea to water early in the day so the plant's leaves and the soil surface can dry off before it gets too hot. Night watering might be good for reducing evaporation, but it also leaves the soil surface wet longer, which increases the risk of root and crown diseases. Man-made features can create small-scale environmental differences that allow native plants to grow where they normally wouldn't. Tall structures can provide shade during hot summers and shelter from frost. Buildings and paved areas can improve soil drainage along their edges because they're usually constructed on a base layer of gravel. Excess water in the soil near the gravel drains away quickly. Planting natives near the tops of walls, stairs, and slopes also ensures good drainage. Paved areas may also give plants a bit of extra water in summer. This is due to the way that water moves through the soil from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. During the rainy season, water moves from wet soil in the open into the drier soil underneath buildings and pavements. Then, when the outside soil dries out in the dry season, the water is drawn back out again. Although there usually isn't very much water available this way, 
Sometimes it's enough to make a difference to nearby plants. Larger plants often don't wait for the water to move out on its own. Instead, they extend the root systems under the paved area to tap into it directly. Once you have a native garden, you look very differently at the creatures that live in it. Spiders, wasps, and reptiles stop being scary and instead become valuable members of your pest control crew. A healthy native garden has a large variety of spiders and beneficial wasps in many sizes, shapes, and colors. Most gardeners think of mites as pests, but many kinds are actually beneficial. Do you see the little red soil mites running around on the pedestal? They help plants grow by breaking down organic matter and eating harmful bacteria, nematodes, and other tiny soil-dwelling fauna. Seeing holes in plant leaves makes many gardeners reach for insecticides. However, in a native garden, finding leaf damage can be something to celebrate. Some of the caterpillars that chewed the leaves of my checker bloom plants became checkered skipper butterflies. Others were collected by birds to feed their babies. I mentioned earlier that native plants can extend their root systems into areas where they have detected moisture. Unfortunately, when plant roots stray into your neighbor's yard, they can get in trouble. Chances are your neighbors water and fertilize more than you do. If your plants detect it, all that moist, rich soil under their lawns and flower beds will be irresistible. Sadly, this can give your natives a shortened lifespan, greater exposure to pests and root diseases, and the risk of mechanical damage to their roots if your neighbor does any digging. To prevent this, discourage your plant's roots from leaving home in the first place. The easiest way is to plant your natives well away from the property boundary. In general, the wider the plant, the wider the root system. That means large trees and shrubs should be planted further away from the boundary than smaller herbaceous plants. To determine how far is safe, I recommend finding out how wide the native plant is likely to be at maturity and then plant it at least that distance away from the neighbor's yard. Allow for even more space if the plant is susceptible to root diseases or will be growing in sandy soil that the roots can easily tunnel through. When planting natives, the holes I dig need to provide the plants with two things. First, the hole should contain enough loose, well-draining soil to give new roots plenty of room to grow. Second, there should be enough moisture at the bottom of the hole to encourage the plants to establish deep roots. So I dig my planting holes at least twice as wide as the plant's pot and about half again as deep. Then, I fill the hole with water and leave it until the next day to give the water time to soak in thoroughly. Once the hole is ready, I place the plant and refill the hole. If the plant needs especially good drainage, I'll mix sand or gravel into the soil from the hole before putting it back. I make sure the plant is sitting a couple of inches higher than the surrounding soil level. One reason for this is that the soil will settle over time and another is that I want to make absolutely sure that water drains away from the plant so it won't ever be sitting in a puddle. After planting, I water thoroughly to eliminate air pockets around the plant's roots. I'll often add a support stake during the first year if the plant is tall or the area is windy. Finally, I'll put a three inch deep layer of mulch around the new plant to suppress weeds and keep moisture in the soil. If I'm using an organic mulch like fir bark, 
I make sure it is at least six inches away from the plant's crown. This is because organic mulches can absorb water and spread diseases. Inorganic mulches like sand or gravel are safer, especially for any plants that are susceptible to rot. I usually plant new natives early in the rainy season, although I may put in new plants as late as the end of February. I think that one gallon sized plants are best for my garden. Plants smaller than that often don't have enough root development to survive inland summers. Bigger pot sizes require a lot of work digging, especially in clay soil. If you want to get free native plants, take advantage of all the volunteer seedlings, root sprouts, and rooted runners that are already growing in your own garden. The most common way plants reproduce sexually is cross-pollination between individuals of the same species to produce seeds. However, some native plants such as salvias can successfully cross with completely different species. These kinds of hybrids are the source of many popular garden cultivars. In addition to reproducing by seed, some plants can also make identical copies of themselves by sprouting new plants from their roots or stems. Root sprouting plants such as hummingbird sage make new plants from buds on their roots. Plants with runners such as yerba buena have stem nodes which grow roots when they touch the soil. Both root sprouts and rooted runners can be detached from the mother plant and transplanted because they already have both roots and top growth. Seedlings are not exact copies of their parents. Most will be similar, but some will turn out very different and sometimes even better. Although seedlings can get started on their own, you can help the process by collecting and planting seeds from your existing native plants. The best time to collect seeds is after they're fully ripe and dry, but before they fall to the ground or are all eaten up by birds and insects. To save seeds for later planting, dry them thoroughly, put them in labeled paper bags, and store them in a cool, dry place. Some kinds of seeds need cold to germinate, so I plant them in my garden just after the first winter rains. When scattering native seeds, I lightly rake the area to make sure they contact the soil. A good place to look for seedlings, root sprouts, and rooted runners is near mature plants. I like to transplant them as early as possible in the rainy season so they can establish themselves before summer. When I find a promising seedling that is too small to be moved yet, I mark it with a small circle of rocks or twigs to avoid damaging it while weeding. When digging up a plant, try to get as much of the root ball as possible. It can be alarming when one of your plants unexpectedly turns brown and loses its leaves. A lot of us had that happen after last summer's extreme heat, ash, and smoke. However, before giving up on a plant, it's good to know how to tell the difference between dormant, damaged, and just plain dead. The most common reason a plant looks dead is dormancy, a resting state where the plant stops or slows its growth. Dormancy evolved as a response to some kind of limiting condition. Winter dormant plants rest because all the available water is frozen. Summer dormant plants do it because there's no rain. Woodland plants may be dormant for most of the year when the leaves of the deciduous trees over them block out sunlight. Most of the time, dormancy is triggered by day length, but some plants will go dormant if conditions get bad enough. As an example, wild checker bloom plants lose their leaves in summer, but the ones in my garden get occasional water and stay evergreen. Catastrophic events such as fire, flood, and insect infestations may also cause plants to look dead. Last summer's ash fall caused a few of my native plants to lose their leaves, 
leaving behind what appeared to be dead twigs and branches. However, natives are tough. The loss of leaves, branches, or even all their top growth may not be enough to kill them. Native plants that live in fire-prone areas can often regrow from buds protected from the heat by bark or soil. There are ways to tell if a plant is alive or dead. Live branches will have some green under the bark and live roots will be flexible but firm. When a plant is dead, its branches and roots will be dry and brittle or mushy. Either way, don't be too quick to drastically prune or dig up the plant. Be patient and wait for the rainy season. If there isn't any sign of regrowth by mid-April, I figure it's safe to remove the plant. Don't blame yourself if some of your plants die. Native plant species are not created equal when it comes to lifespan. Plants like poppies live only one or two years, while oaks can live for hundreds. Also, some individual plants might be stronger than others of the same species. That's why I always plant at least three of each kind. Losing one of the three might be due to weakness in that one. If all three die, then I chose a bad place to plant them. I hope you've enjoyed my video and can come see my garden in person next year. If you want to try growing California native plants in your own garden, there are many nurseries that sell them. A few also have websites where you can get plants by mail order. For more information about nurseries that sell California natives, check out the Bringing Back the Natives and Calscape websites. Well, Nancy, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. I think that uh, if you ever want to stop what you're doing, you have a promising career as a garden videographer before you. Nancy made that video herself, as a number of our hosts did, but th their efforts really showed. So um, let me tell people that if you go on the tour's website, which is bringingbackthenatives.net, and to the agenda, you can click there and you can go see Nancy's garden. Her plant list is there, additional photos of her garden. Um, let's see, so some questions that we had, um, and also I wanna say that this presentation and all the others will be up on the tour's YouTube channel. So you can look at it again later because there was a lot of information covered there. And if you'd like to see more of Nancy's garden, she was on the virtual tour last year in 2020. And that presentation is also available on the tour's YouTube channel. So you spent a lot of time talking about watering and uh, someone asked, um, how about watering new plants that can't wait four weeks? How often do you water a new plant? When I first uh, plant um, a new plant, I do give it a lot of water at the bottom of the hole. But I also, um, if it's a new, new plant the first year, I will water once every two weeks. Uh, and I do mulch quite a bit so to retain the soil moisture. The following year, every three weeks, and then it goes to the every four weeks like all the rest of them. So you would probably be planting in the fall then when you're watering every two weeks, you're giving it the best possible start? Right, you want to plant your plants um, fairly early in the rainy season because you wanna get as much root development as possible by the time the uh, dry season shows up. Um, okay. I would like to add though, I saw some comments earlier about um, how I water and I'm actually using uh, micro sprayers. So, the rate of uh, water being applied is much lower than it would be for conventional sprinklers. Okay. And then someone asked, how deep, when you do your test digging to see like, is the water getting down deep enough? How deep do you dig to see if the water is reaching down? Um, I usually dig um, basically until I don't see any sign of moisture anymore. I mean, there's no point in digging a one foot hole if the moisture's only gone down four inches. <clears throat> okay. I wonder if you can tell us something about, uh, I suspect you have a long bloom in your garden, like what kind of blooms generally through the season and how long do you have color in your garden for? Uh, there are a few plants that give me color year round. The, uh, 
Okay, I forget. I keep forgetting common names. It's the Gambelia and the uh, the bladder pod will actually bloom a little all year round, but for the rest of the plants, uh, the first bloom probably would be Manzanitas, and that's usually uh, December for me. And then I will have at least something in bloom all the way through to uh, I'd say mid fall. Uh, the last things to bloom would be the um, California fuchsia. Okay. And then someone asked, so what does your garden look like in late summer? What happens then in the quiet period? Uh, basically in late summer, um, I, I prune and um, it looks, there are some things that are evergreen. There are a lot of things that are summer deciduous. I would compare it really to the way a conventional garden looks in the middle of winter. Uh, because basically all kinds of gardens have do a dormant season of some kind. For conventional gardens, it's midwinter. For natives, it tends to be like fall or mm -hmm. late summer. Mm -hmm. <coughs> see, uh, Stephanie, do you see any other questions? We'll probably take like That's one really, more. Really, really quick. I know we don't have much time, but um, Nancy, do you hand water or or you strip and then maybe add on to that? Do you cycle like the hour you were talking about? You break it up into bits and let the water absorb in between. Right. My my garden is too big really to hand water, so I have uh, micro sprayers. Um, I use micro sprayers because it uh, distributes water evenly. Unfortunately, with drip, you're establishing a very steep moisture gradient, and you're more likely to get root diseases if you have a gradient like that. Uh, I know when I first started gardening, <coughs> excuse me, with with natives, uh, everyone was promoting drip irrigation for them. But I think if you check now, the experts are saying that um, microsprayers are better. Okay. I think that um, <clears throat> we are probably going to thank Nancy and um, move on. Let me say that, Nancy, are you able to stay and answer some questions on Zoom? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm somewhat new to Zoom, so it may take me a while to, uh, to answer the individual questions, but I will stay on as well as uh, going on YouTube and answering ones there. Okay, so uh, if you have questions that didn't get answered, Nancy's gonna um, take a stab at uh, doing that. Let me say that uh, you can see Nancy's garden uh, in person when we uh, are back to doing live tours again. I've been there. It's just a beautiful, beautiful garden, both the plants and also the art that she has in it just makes it a spectacular garden. So I wanna say, Nancy, thank you so much for making your video, that fantastic presentation. And we're going to move on then. And I'm going to uh, share my screen here. All right, so I'm gonna talk for a moment about uh, landscape design. So I started out trying to design my own native plant garden and it never looked good. Uh, I realized eventually I needed professional help and turn to Four Dimensions Landscape Company. If you're interested in converting your garden to natives, I always recommend that people work with a company that specializes in designing native plant gardens. And also that you let that designer know that you want a native plant garden. On the tours website, which is bringingbackthenatives.net, you'll find um, one of the poppies is the find a designer poppy. And if you go there, you'll find a number of designers that specialize in native plant gardens. Uh, if you would like help designing and installing a native plant garden, you might want to contact one of our sponsors, Four Dimensions Landscape Company. This is uh, the Holland Garden, which has been on the tour a couple times there in Oakland. Uh, Four Dimensions is a, an award-winning landscape design company. This is the Hildebrand Garden in Walnut Creek that was on the tour some years ago. Their motto is restoring the earth one garden at a time. I think this is the Welch Garden in Oakland, which has been on the tour. And their goal is to bring people and nature together. You can call on Four Dimensions to design, build, or nurture your own garden. You can reach them at fourdimensionslandscape.com or at 510-893-1999.